So we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us to celebrate dangerous ideas on campus, sex, conspiracy, and academic freedom in the age of JFK. My name is Heather and I'm the publicity manager at the University of Illinois Press. And I'm just gonna go over some brief logistical information and introduce our guests before we get started. First of all, thank you so much to Matthew Ehrlich and Ryan Ross for being here today. They're going to talk for about 40 minutes, and then we will have time for a 20-minute Q&A at the end. You can enter questions throughout the event by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can use promo code DIOC40 to get a 40% discount on the book on the University of Illinois Press website. I'll put the promo code and a link to the book in the chat box. We will also be recording the event and posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. You'll receive an email from Zoom after the event that will have both the discount code and a link to our YouTube channel as well. And now I'll just briefly introduce our guests. Matthew C. Ehrlich is a professor emeritus of journalism at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His previous books, all published by the University of Illinois Press, include Journalism in the Movies, Radio Utopia, Postwar Audio Documentary and the Public Interest, Heroes and Scoundrels, The Image of the Journalist in Popular Culture, co-authored with Joe Saltzman, and Kansas City versus Oakland, The Bitter Sports Rivalry That Defined an Era. Ryan A. Ross is Assistant Director of the University of Illinois Alumni Association's History and Traditions Programs, Associate Editor of Illinois Alumni Magazine, and Curator of the Richmond Family Welcome Gallery at Alice Campbell Alumni Center. Ryan is the author of a monograph on early Illinois newspapers and articles on Illinois history and politics, private libraries, film history, and historical archaeology. And now, without further ado, I will turn it over to our panelists. Thanks again to everyone for being here today. All right. Thanks, Heather. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you have any questions uh, throughout the event, feel free to enter them in the Q&A box down uh, at the, the bottom taskbar. And we're going to be uh, answering those questions toward the end. But feel free to ask them in the Q&A at any time. So, uh, Matt, I'll start by saying how much I enjoy the book. Thank you. I, I especially like the way that you tackle big sort of amorphous concepts like freedom of speech and academic freedom um, by taking the stories of these two very different U of I professors, Leo Cook and Revel Oliver, and using them as bookends to tell a broader story about uh, the social, cultural, and political climates at the U of I during the early 60s. And then you use the controversies over Cook and Oliver as sort of jumping off points to show how much the U of I was starting to change uh, as we got deeper into the decade. So uh, first, I just wanted to say that it's, it's really well done and I congratulate you. Thank you very much, Ryan, I appreciate it. And thank you for doing this today. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so to, to set the stage for the rest of our conversation about Cook and Oliver, I'd like to hear you talk a bit about uh, what the U of I was like in the early 60s. Well, it was in some ways, I guess, similar to the way it appears to be today, and in other ways it was very much different. And one of the differences is it, uh, the, the uh, composition of the undergraduate student population. Um, it was about 70% male and 30% female. And of course, the uh, female proportion of the undergraduate student body is much higher today. Um, it was overwhelmingly white. Uh, there were comparatively few students of color, only a couple of hundred uh, African-American students at the start of the decade. And that number would increase a little bit by the middle of the decade, but it wouldn't be until 1968 that there really would be an effort to recruit more African-American students to the University of Illinois. Um, it was uh, the fraternity capital of America. Uh, it may still be today. <laughs> um, I know that's always been a, a, a big component of undergraduate student life on this campus. That was something that they were very proud of back in 1960. Um, it was a fairly conservative campus. The students weren't really known for political activism or for demonstrating very much. Um, the biggest event uh, probably every year was an annual uh, water fight that took place every spring. I guess it was sort of the precursor to unofficial uh, 
um, in that students would celebrate the coming of spring by opening the uh, fire hydrants on campus and just uh, fighting in the water. But other than that, in terms of demonstrations and the kind of things that you would think of as being typical of college campuses later in the 1960s, that, that would be a few years in the future. And it was um, a climate of uh, what was referred to as in loco parentis, or in the place of a parent, whereby there were a lot of regulations governing student behavior with the university sort of acting in the place of a parent. And that meant lots of rules and regulations. It meant curfews, especially for women students. There was very much a double standard between male students and female students. Um, and um, that, as time went by, would be a source of contention. And there were um, students at this time um, especially Roger Ebert write about uh, things like the, the three feet rule mm -hmm. and other measures that were in place to make sure that uh, students didn't become uh, as close as they might like to be. Yeah, the three foot rule was basically if you were a couple meeting on campus in a campus uh, residence hall lounge or wherever, you had to have three of your four feet on the floor at all times. And there would be people who would occasionally come by and monitor this. And if one of the, uh, if there were fewer than three feet on the floor, uh, you would be reprimanded or worse. And uh, Roger Ebert, who was an undergraduate uh, between 1960 and um, 1964, uh, wrote that, you know, there are creative ways to get around this if you're trying to be close as a couple. When we're talking about couples, we're kind of talking about the stereotypical male-female couple. Uh, Same-sex couples were very much closeted at the time, although, of course, they did exist. And so that was part of in loco parentis. Um, the campus police would uh, go through the community and um, look for campus parking stickers in the parking lots of motels. So it was really designed to police any semblance of, um, of uh, sexual activity that was very much um, restricted during that era. One, one of the things that I found uh, most striking in those sections of the book where you're talking about this sort of environment was uh, the double standard that existed in punishments that were doled out to the men and women students. Oftentimes, uh, in, in particular with the, the, uh, the students being at motels sorts of situations, the, the, the men wouldn't be punished at all and the women would be harshly punished. Yeah, my favorite story about that it actually was as late as 1964. This was still a concern, and I think actually for some years after that, actually. But um, there were two people in a committed relationship. They were sitting in a car off campus, and they were kissing. That's all they were doing. They were kissing. Uh, a police car interrupted them, took the young woman away in the police car, put her on so-called informal conduct probation, whatever that meant, and did nothing to the young man. And the young woman was like, what is going on? This makes me feel, her actual quote was, cheap and ashamed. And she had every right to feel that way. But yeah. that's how silly the double standard could get. And, you know, people who have studied this era have said, when you're talking about the so-called sexual revolution of the 1960s, it wasn't so much uh, young people wanting quote unquote, free love. It was just that these kinds of very silly, arbitrary rules that seem to shift and change according to the time of day, according to the time of week, just got to be very frustrating and uh, started to cause a whole lot of complaints. And that was really one of the biggest triggers for the change in mores and eventually the change in campus regulations as time went on. Mm. So out of this environment, in March of 1960, we have Leo Cook, who is a U of I biology professor, uh, who writes a letter to the Daily Illini that just creates a firestorm. So who was Leo Cook and uh, what did he do that was so controversial? Leo Cook was a biology professor who had had several 
sh very short teaching gigs. You know, with, in today's higher education climate, they talk about the gig academy and contingent academic labor and adjunct labor. And that's really not a new development. It, it has dates back many decades. And Leo Cook was kind of an example of that. So he spent a year here and a year there. And part of the reason he moved around so much was he had this gift for alienating his uh, academic superiors, his department heads. And so he ended up at the University of Illinois in 1955 and actually was able to stick around for a little while but gradually started to irritate the people that he was working for at Illinois to the point that uh, in 1959, they gave him a terminal contract that was set to expire in 1961. They were basically just fed up with them. And so partly because he knew he had nothing or figured he had nothing left to lose, he already had been writing a lot of very uh, controversial letters to the editor of the local newspapers, especially critiquing Christianity because he was a, a dedicated secular humanist and very proud about being a biologist who is very scientific in his thinking. And so he came across a column in the Daily Illini in March 1960 that had been co-authored by a couple of undergraduate students called, uh, the headline was Sex Ritualized. And what the two young men in this guest column were writing about was smooching in sorority lounges um, and the ritual surrounding smooching, making out. And that's all that was going on um, in the sorority lounges. Um, the fact that uh, couples were obligated to keep making out in the sorority lounges until the 1 a.m. curfew for young women. It didn't matter if you were bored or tired or whatever and wanted to go home early, you couldn't do that because that was a big social uh, faux pas. You had to keep making out until 1 a.m. And so the students in this guest column in the Daily Alina were just talking about how silly that was, how dehumanizing it was, and basically saying, you know, young people need to appreciate each other as people. They need to get past these uh, stereotypical gender roles. In a way, these young men who were writing this article were kind of ahead of the curve in that sense. But Leo Cook saw this and he decided that they had completely missed the point. And the real issue was the fact that you could only smooch and that there was this social stigma about going past the smooching stage or at the very, what was referred to in the day as petting or heavy petting. You could go only so far, but the actual act of sexual intercourse was absolutely verboten. And he said, well, a mutually satisfactory sexual experience for young people wouldn't be so bad and in fact would produce longer lasting marriages. So the Daily Illini printed it, they printed it at the exact moment that thousands of high schoolers and their families were descending on Champion Urbana for the IHSA State Basketball Tournament, which is about to return to Champion Urbana. Mm -hmm. And so it was a perfect storm of timing and angry letters to the Daily Illini, um, a letter writing campaign organized by a former communist turned uh, arch conservative minister in Chicago urging action against the um, university. And it resulted in Leo Cook getting fired for that letter to the Daily Illini. So what, what was the fallout of Cook's firing? Well, when he was fired, he was basically put on leave um, in the middle of the spring semester with the understanding that his, um, his tenure he was not actually tenured in the academic sense, but his academic employment at the U of I would be terminated at the end of that academic year, the essentially June 1960, a year earlier than it was supposed to. And so there was a backlash against this. People knew that there had been a letter writing campaign organized against him. Uh, people at other campuses started to write to protest, including in Berkeley, four years before the free speech movement emerged in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. uh, students there organized a protest, sent uh, the university protest letters. Same thing happened at the University of Iowa, Michigan, and elsewhere. Uh, there was a big rally on the uh, quad outside the administration building um, when Cook was uh, relieved of his duties. Uh, they were holding signs saying things like, not free love, but free speech, emphasizing the fact that free speech was a concern. 
And so there was a big protest about it. It didn't save Leo Cook's job, but eventually it got the attention of the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, which launched an, invest an investigation. This didn't happen until a year or two later, but eventually by 1963, the university was put on censure, an AAUP censure. And it prompted the university, although you know David Henry who was the president at the time, he swore there was no uh, infraction of academic freedom, no question of academic freedom involved. Um, he knew that it was still an embarrassment to the university, uh, indicated that the university would be willing to revise its statutes. And so what happened by 1966, this was a very lengthy process, but by then, the university had what one professor at the time called the best statutes of um, academic freedom and tenure in the country. Uh, prior to that statute's revision, a professor could be dismissed for conduct deemed seriously prejudicial to the university, however that was defined. And that was the whole problem is that what is seriously prejudicial? It's basically what whoever in power says is prejudicial. Same thing was the case with students in a different way. Students could be disciplined for conduct that um, was de deemed to be unbecoming of a student. And somebody in the Daily Line, I commented at that time, well, that could cover anything from spitting on the sidewalk to murdering your professor. <laughs> So this kind of vagueness in the academic statutes governing the faculty at the university and also the disciplinary code governing the students, these were the things that caused so much um, uh, dissension during the first years of the 1960s and eventually led to change both uh, among the faculty ranks and also among the student ranks. And Leo Cook was a key in that whole process. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that I... Um found most interesting in your writing about um, how, how the statutes were before they, ch they changed, how they were at the time that, C that Cook wrote the letter, was that even before the, the letter writing campaign against him took off, he was, he was basically already a Cook goose because there were members of the board of trustees who were offended by his letter and president Henry was offended by it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think even uh, just that small collection of people uh, could have been enough to, to oust him without anything else. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. The right after the letter was published, a couple of the trustees wrote to President Henry saying, you know, this is completely beyond the pale. This guy needs to go. And uh, David Henry himself, who actually was raised uh, with a fundamentalist uh, Baptist upbringing, um, I'm, his administrative experience and uh, his uh, education broadened his outlook uh, beyond uh, just that. But, you know, that, that did strike me that as of 1960, um, this notion that sex outside of marriage, especially among uh, undergraduates, was deeply offensive to so many people. Um, it wasn't just that it was embarrassing to the university, it was that people just plain considered it wrong and immoral. And it was in the statutes at that time, conduct seriously prejudicial included anything that um, seemed to be contrary to commonly accepted standards of morality. Mm -hmm. And the standards of morality at that time were basically that sex was something that should take place within marriage and not outside marriage. And people understood that, of course, people were having sex outside marriage. Mm -hmm. And of course, undergraduates were having sex outside marriage and getting pregnant and all that. But to condone it was simply something that you did not do. And it is important to remember that because if we read the letter today, most people, not necessarily all, but a uh, great many people would look at this letter that Leo Cook wrote and say, what was the big deal? How could people possibly get so upset? Mm -hmm. And the fact is that standards of morality change. What is considered to be legitimate sources of debate change. And uh, what... Um, uh, was once considered to be wrong can over time, you know, not be such a big deal. And that's why we have to be very careful in considering questions of academic freedom. Uh, 
uh, be very careful about saying this is something that you cannot talk about. This is something that uh, should not be covered by academic freedom. When you start putting those kinds of limits on discussion and ideas, mm -hmm. then it becomes very dangerous because we don't know what tomorrow will bring in terms of what may be acceptable, what may not be acceptable. Um, and we may look silly in terms of trying to restrict something today that tomorrow may not seem like such a big deal. So I, I think this is a good a good point to transition to our, our next. Uh, I feel strange calling them characters because they were real people, but you know, in the sense of your book, they're the they're the two main characters, the protagonists. Yeah, 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 yes, protagonists. Um, so at, at the time of Cook's letter, the U.S. was beginning to change in meaningful ways, and later that year, uh, November of sixty. Kennedy was elected president. Uh, the civil rights movement was having an impact around the country and here on campus um, with protests against discriminatory practices in local businesses. And in a few years, uh, by 64, the baby boomers would start to come to campus in huge numbers. And out of this atmosphere, another U of I faculty member, uh, caused controversy for his beliefs. And this other one was Revelo Oliver, who served as a tenured professor of classics at the university for more than 30 years. Unlike Cook, who he, he had sort of um, several minor controversies that you were talking about leading up to his one big controversy that he got fired for. But uh, Oliver, he was allowed to remain on the faculty for decades, despite being a source of controversy and embarrassment for the university um, for a, a very large chunk of his tenure here. Mm -hmm. So who was Revelo Oliver and what did he do that was so controversial? <laughs> Revelo Oliver um, was from Illinois. Um, he, in addition, as you mentioned, he was a, a longtime classics professor. He also got his degrees from the University of Illinois. Um, and um, he, um, in the 1950s, after having a very uncontroversial, conventional academic career where he rose through the academic ranks, um, became a tenured full professor by the mid 50s. And um, in 1956, he joined the staff of uh, National Review, which had just been founded by William F. Buckley Jr., the conservative weekly. And over time, he kept drifting further and further and further to the political right, um, to the point that a few years after he started writing for National Review, William F. Buckley expelled him from National Review because Oliver's views were becoming explicitly racist and explicitly anti-Semitic. And uh, Buckley knew that those kinds of views could be potentially very damaging to the conservative movement that he was trying to uh, nurture through the yeah. National Review. So um, Oliver was, as you mentioned, already a controversial figure by the start of the 1960s. And um, we don't need to repeat some of the things that he said here. It, it, um, I um, do quote some of them in the book just to show the kind of very offensive language that he engaged in, uh, but explicitly racist and explicitly anti-Semitic. Um, and um, as his scholarly output declined, his public speaking engagements increased, especially after he joined and became one of the directors of the John Birch Society, mm -hmm. uh, which had been formed in the late 1950s and became increasingly prominent once uh, John F. Kennedy took office and president in 1961. So um, Oliver already had some run-ins with the U of I administration, already had caused some public controversies where some of his speeches had been made public. Um, you know, some of the newspapers would uh, run questioning editorials about why is this guy on the faculty? Some people would write angry, angry letters to the president's office, just like they had done for Leo Cook. Uh, in contrast to Leo Cook, because Revelo Oliver had tenure, mm -hmm. the university consistently said 
look, this guy has the right of, of what's called extramural expression. He can speak as a private citizen without fear of retaliation. Um, that's one of the fundamental tenets, along with freedom of research and freedom of teaching, of academic freedom, the freedom to speak as a private citizen, just the same as any other citizen can speak. Um, so Oliver kept his job. And then when um, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963, Oliver wrote a very lengthy two-part commentary in American Opinion, which was the publication of the uh, John Birch Society, saying that Kennedy was assassinated because he was a loathsome communist uh, involved in a massive conspiracy in league with Nikita Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. And the Soviets basically rubbed him out and the communist, international communist conspiracy rubbed him out uh, because he had outlived his usefulness to them. This was published in February 1964. So it was literally weeks after John F. Kennedy had been assassinated and all the widespread grief over JFK's assassination had occurred. And part of the reason that Oliver had such a violent reaction to JFK was uh, because of the things that you mentioned, Brian, the rise of civil rights, uh, mm -hmm. the rise of uh, questioning among students, the change in values, uh, the rise of people like um, the methods of John Dewey and um, uh, changes in the American educational system, moving away from the classical education that Red Bull Oliver valued so much. And so he sort of saw JFK as the embodiment of everything he despised, all these liberal tendencies that were starting to creep into public life in the part of the first part of the 1960s. So it created a firestorm. Um, mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning again that his racism and anti-Semitism, although some of that came through in the JFK piece that he wrote, those were not really the factors that caused the controversy. What caused the controversy was he was saying nasty things about a president who was beloved among a lot of people, especially young people, who had just been murdered. And again, it was the kind of thing like, you just don't do that. A professor a you know, person entrusted with um, young people's um, education should not be saying those things. And so again, there were angry letters to the president, there were protests to the board of trustees, but this time, partly because of the Leo Cook case, partly because of the statute revisions that were already underway in response to the Leo Cook case, mm -hmm. partly because the university did not want another academic embarrassment, academic freedom embarrassment, when they were already censured by the AAUP, and especially because Revelo Oliver held tenure, which Leo Cook did not, Revelo Oliver held his job and he would continue teaching at the U of I until the late 1970s. So uh, a few things. Um, one of the things that I, that I really um, found fascinating with the university's response to the the firestorm that Oliver caused was that they said, you know, he's he's speaking as a private citizen, but for until a certain point when when I think Oliver got wise and thought, well, maybe I shouldn't be playing up my tie to the university so much here. He was uh, he was really drawing on his university credentials to validate what he was saying in his. And lectures. I mean, there was always a bio saying the first thing there was, you know, Revel O.P. Oliver is professor of classics at the University of Illinois. And then, you know, whatever it was that what that he was saying in his writings and lectures. Um, eventually he stopped doing that. But I just thought that that was that the university consensus was that even though he was playing up his university ties he was still not doing it on the university's behalf. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great, the, the um, tenets of academic freedom, especially as uh, they're expressed in um, uh, the AAUP statement, the AAUP and um, another organization that put together a statement of, um, of uh, academic freedom and tenure principles back in 1940. Um, 
you should not, when you're speaking as a private citizen, a professor speaking as a private citizen, you should take pains to make it clear that you're not speaking for the institution, you're speaking only for yourself. But there is kind of a gray area in that for all the public speaking engagements that Leo Cook was in, or that brother Revelo Oliver was engaged in, um, he was regularly billed as a University of Illinois classics professor. So a lot of the people who were complaining about Revelo Oliver were saying like, look, yeah, he's not um, explicitly saying that he's speaking on behalf of the university, but the only reason that anyone's taking him seriously is because he's this guy with this full professorship at a major university. He's got all this academic, all these academic degrees. He speaks all these different languages. All of this is publicized. So doesn't that make a difference? And the university did investigate that and they couldn't really find an instance where Oliver was really consciously playing that up to the extent mm -hmm. that it really did make it sound as though he was stating a, a, a formal University of Illinois position. So he was able to get away with it. And, you know, university administrators at the time would say like, he can do, he, he has the right as a private citizen to say what he wants to, even though I, as an administrator, think this guy is totally off the, off the rails and everything he says is false and misleading and malicious, he still has a right to say it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. I I I enjoyed reading those portions. Uh, the, at one point, you were talking about uh, Jack Peltison, who was uh, who was later the chancellor. But at that time, was he provost then? Uh, I believe or, he was liberal arts and sciences. Dean. He was dean of LAS. Yeah, he he moved but, through a number of positions. But he he you described him as uh, through gritted teeth saying. Right. You know, I disagree with everything this man is saying, but I support his right to say it. And this same sort of um, sentiment was echoed in um, editorials in the Daily Illini that Roger Ebert and other people wrote. Um, just the, I, I just thought that that was, it, it was a, a sterling illustration of what uh, freedom of speech means. Well, academic freedom. And academic freedom also. Yeah. yeah. And um, that was, uh, yeah, it, 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 the Daily Illini archives, which are uh, publicly online from this time period. Mm -hmm. It was interesting to read the student editorials. Uh, Roger Ebert was actually the editor-in-chief of the Daily Illini during the 1963-64 school year when this whole Revelo Oliver controversy erupted over JFK. And several of the student columnists um, also wrote about it. And pretty much to a person, with maybe one exception, uh, they said, um, yeah, this guy has a, to the right to, um, to his point of view. His point of view is ridiculous. And it's silly that so much controversy is being made over it. But, you know, it, it, people, it, college students are always the target of a lot of consternation among older people. This has always been the case. It always will be the case. In the first half of the 1960s, college students were regularly derided in the national news media as being coddled and as being fragile and as being frivolous. And uh, if you read the commentary, at least in the Daily Illini, they weren't like that at all. They, they understood what was at stake and they um, upheld the principles of freedom of speech and of academic freedom. It should be mentioned that all of these writers, as, as near as I could tell, were white. So mm -hmm. they had never been targeted with the kind of hate speech that Revelo Oliver at his worst engaged in. And so that is kind of the two-edged sword that Revelo Oliver kind of forces us to confront that, yeah, we can say like, yes, he absolutely had the right to do to speak, um, even though with the case of JFK, a lot of what he said was silly about this massive conspiracy that JFK was directly involved in. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to some of his more uh, blatantly offensive speech, um, when we decide whether that also is worth protecting, and I argue in the book that uh, through gritted teeth, <laughs> that it is mm -hmm. worth protecting, um, because of um, the dangers of starting to decide what speech is acceptable and what isn't, um, then it becomes uh, a thornier, more complicated issue that is um, you know, that 
is more troublesome, frankly. I found it troublesome to deal with. So the um, a second ago when you were talking about the not not Oliver's hate speech, but his um, his theories about the Kennedy assassination being seeming sort of silly just when you say out loud what it was that he was saying. But th nevertheless, um, he was called before the Warren Commission so mm -hmm. to check him out and see, you know, let's see if there's some truth to what this guy is saying. So can you talk a little bit about what the Warren Commission decided? Yeah, well, the Warren Commission decided specifically about Oliver that he had absolutely nothing of worth to say. Um, but I should go back and kind of half correct myself. And when I said what Oliver was writing about was silly, it was, again, just this massive conspiracy that JFK was directly orchestrating. I think that part, at least I think, was silly. I think a majority of people would say would be silly. But, you know, the basic argument that there was a conspiracy that underlay the JFK assassination mm -hmm. and uh, that the Warren Commission would kind of whitewash everything, that's not really that far out of mainstream public opinion, right? I mean, lots yeah. of people mm -hmm. believe that there was some sort of conspiracy behind the JFK assassination and that the Warren Commission's report doesn't get nearly at the truth of what happened. There's still mm -hmm. a great deal of controversy over what exactly happened, what such a conspiracy might have involved. But there again, it, it points to the fact that, um, you know, public opinion can shift over time. People from the very day that Kennedy was assassinated were speculating over whether a conspiracy was behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, what has perhaps shifted more in terms of public opinion is just uh, opinion about John F. Kennedy. Um, once mm -hmm. the grief about his assassination passed and the shock over his assassination passed, um, you know, a lot of people started really reflecting on how good a president he was and how good a person he was. And so, you know, a lot of people today certainly would have some concern over how uh, Kennedy conducted his private life um, and uh, his politics are a source of uh, controversy in some quarters. So yeah, you know, some of what Oliver was saying is not necessarily so controversial today. So uh, uh, you, were, you were talking about just in terms of uh, the timeline of how this was all playing out. So Oliver's essay about the Kennedy assassination. The first part of it appeared in February of 64. And this was during a time when the university was still under censure from the AAUP and the new statutes uh, on uh, conduct and academic freedom wouldn't take place until 66. So how, how did the AAUP react to this new controversy with Oliver and how the university was handling it? Uh, well, that censure again kind of uh, was hanging over how the U of I responded to the case and the U of I's own AEUP chapter and its own academic freedom committee. Um, again, because they didn't want a repeat of what had happened in, in making the censure uh, happen in the first place. Uh, that's part of the reason that they did decide to recommend no action against Oliver, and then David Henry, the president, and the board of trustees concurred. Um, the national AAUP, which had level, uh, levied uh, or leveled the uh, censure against the U of I, um, applauded the action or the lack of action that the U of I took against Revelo Oliver, but the censure would remain in place until 1967. Mm -hmm. um, partly they were waiting the national AAUP for those statute revisions to finally be passed. If you've ever been involved in statutes revisions at any level, it go, it's a very lengthy and very tedious process. So that really was uh, the reason for the delay. And there was still the fallout from the Leo Cook case because um, Leo Cook was trying to get the university to pay him the salary for the year um, that he, um, he, he was dismissed a year early and Cook wanted the salary that he had lost because of that. And the U of I refused to do that. The AAUP kept trying to pressure the university into paying him for that extra year's salary. 
finally realized it wasn't going to happen, so they did lift the censure. But it took a long time, um, several years after, even the Rebel o. Oliver case. So what, uh, coming back to Cook just really quickly, what, what did he do uh, with the rest of his life after he was fired from the university? He, um, if you kind of came, came up with a caricature of all the trends of the 1960s and the counterculture, Leo Cook did all of it, basically. He practiced nudism. Um, he took LSD in 1963, several years before that kind of became a thing to do. Um, he went to the Woodstock Arts Festival. Um, by 1970, he was firmly in the anti-war movement. He slept on the floor with a big Viet Cong flag on the wall, had a black arm, arm, protest armband. Um, and uh, finally, by the uh, end of the 1960s, he finally decided to heck with it. I'm out of here. And he moved his family to Arkansas to live off the land. Um, and there was one other uh, thing that uh, back in 1963 was part of a kind of a, a free speech, uh, free thought um, camp in North Carolina called Camp Summer Lane that uh, quickly ceased to exist when a mob stormed it and burned it to the ground because of rumors of all the free thought that was happening there. He also formed the Sexual Freedom League. So, yeah, he led a very eventful life after he left U of I. It sounds like it. So what, what about Revelo Oliver? And the, the, so he, he lived until 1994. So after the, the initial uh, fallout to his activities, which included, I, I, this was the, this is, I think this is always going to stick with me, the fact that the university got so many complaints about Oliver that they had a form letter that they sent to people in response, which is just, yeah. but after that, that period of where he was causing a lot of controversy started to die down, what did, what did he do with the rest of his life? He continued to drift to the right and continued to drift to political extremism to the point that even the John Birch Society expelled him. And after he retired in 1977, he devoted himself to political writings um, yeah, embraced Holocaust denial, um, became even more virul virulent in his racism and anti-Semitism, became a hero at that time to white nationalists. So really a very sad, unpleasant uh, case uh, mm -hmm. that he epitomized. And again, he is an example of uh, you know, once he left the University of Illinois, academic freedom was less of a concern, but his viewpoints were pretty much pronounced even before he retired. And um, so again, he's kind of a test case about, uh, he, he shows that uh, academic freedom is not something that only um, protects people on the political left or so-called liberal professors. It also protects people on the right and even the extreme right. And um, for people who are very pro-academic freedom, as I like to think that I am, um, looking at his case and the kind of speech that gets protected, and you realize that it can include some really unpleasant sorts of things. So there is a price that, you know, the, the, when uh, at the time of the Revelo Oliver case in the mid uh, 1960s, the academic freedom case, uh, the academic freedom committee at the U of I said, Academic freedom is not without its price to a university, but the price is worth paying. And mm -hmm. Rebel Oliver is a really good example of that. It's part of the price that has to be paid. Did you feel any sort of trepidation about writing about him? Yes, absolutely, because he's not a pleasant person to write about, and he's not pleasant company. I mean, I, you know, when you mm -hmm. spend a lot of time writing about someone, um, uh, you know, I wrote a book many years ago about uh, radio producers uh, just after World War II who were a very, you know, fun lot to spend time with. And Rebel o. Oliver was not someone who was fun to read or fun to write about. Mm -hmm. And anytime you spend time with someone like that, you do run the possible risk about legitimizing what he writes. So it's a very difficult line to tread where you say, this person's thought is um, absolutely abhorrent, and we have to really be careful about 
saying it's normal, saying it's okay. But at the same time, we have to point out why it is so important to say that this kind of speech, when it is spoken as a private citizen by a professor, is important to protect because when we start deciding this speech is okay, that speech is not okay. And by we, I'm especially talking about public, the public opinion, as opposed to fellow academics. That's the difference between academic freedom and uh, freedom of speech. Academic freedom is fellow academics deciding uh, what constitutes um, acceptable speech, including extramural expression. And when we start relying on public opinion to decide those kinds of questions, we really run into big problems in a big hurry because public opinion again shifts and public opinion gets mm -hmm. heated very quickly. Um, and so that's why we have to be very careful about putting any sort of limits on that kind of expression. So we're gonna move on to the Q and A here in a second, but before we do, I just wanted to ask you, what was it about these stories that caused you to wanna to write this book? Well, I was raised by, uh, for better or worse, I've been um, around college campuses pretty much my whole life. My parents were college teachers um, and um, I majored in journalism in college and uh, worked as a journalist uh, for several public radio stations affiliated with universities and then became a journalism professor. So I've always been interested in the relationship between higher education and um, the public uh, as reflected in the news media. And when I found out that these two cases had attracted so much attention, um, I decided to, they, have, they were really good examples of how higher education does relate to public opinion and um, how higher education triggers controversies over really contentious public issues like sex, like a conspiracy thinking in, in politics. Um, and uh, Revelo Oliver and Leo Cook, even though I said Oliver was an unpleasant person, he was a character, a really interesting mm -hmm. and a kind of appalling sort of way character, just as Leo Cook was a really interesting person. So it was a good story. And for the journalist, ex-journalist in me, it was a fun kind of story to, to tell. And I hope that the book kind of humanizes higher education and shows why academic freedom is such a contentious issue and kind of clarifies the um, very high stakes involved in academic uh, freedom controversies and shows that things that happened 60 years ago are still relevant today. Just briefly, could you talk a little bit more about that, about the relevance that this story still has to what we're having? Yeah, the, you know, sex is obviously still very much an issue um, on college campuses, questions of consent. Conspiracy thinking in our politics and culture, we find that uh, being reflected constantly in the news every single day. And um, Revelo Oliver kind of embodied and presaged those kinds of controversies over um, conspiracy thinking. And of course, academic freedom. We have big debates um, in higher education and in elementary and secondary education over what should be taught, what should be said over so-called critical race theory over books being banned from the classroom and over questions of academic freedom. These things just do not disappear from the news and from public life ever. So yeah, they are for better or for worse, still very much relevant. All right. So we do have some questions, a few questions, I think. Yes. So, okay. Um, this first question from Mary Stewart, we, we answered what Cook did after he left the U of I. Um, Second one you've also answered about his whether Oliver's thinking changed or if it, it uh, um, stayed along the same lines. John Wilson asks, has the U of I ever issued a formal apology to Cook for his dismissal? As far as I know, no. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned in passing that... Um, Cook wanted his final year of salary paid by the U of I. He actually also separately sued the University of Illinois and it went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which declined to hear it. Uh, every court below the U.S. Supreme Court ruled against Leo Cook. But um, the university and uh, President David Henry was convinced that it had not done wrong. They realized that the Cook case was an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. 
and the AAUP censure was an embarrassment. But um, they didn't think they had done anything wrong in dismissing Leo Cook. Um, and for his part, uh, David Henry um, insisted that no question of academic freedom was at stake in the Leo Cook case. Um, so they didn't see any reason to issue an apology to Leo Cook. Um, in the connection with the Leo Cook case and the reason it uh, caused a lot of consternation among the AAUP um, at the time uh, that the Leo Cook case happened was the whole notion of academic responsibility. You know, I think it's Spider-Man, right? With great freedom comes great responsibility. And this has regularly been said about professors too. You've got academic freedom, okay, fine. But with freedom, doesn't responsibility come with that? Don't you have the responsibility to conduct yourself in a professional manner? And um, if you're saying really outrageous stuff or what is deemed to be outrageous at the time that is said, um, don't standards of responsibility apply? And what the Leo Cook case kind of brought into sharp relief was that how do you define responsible uh, responsibility? What one person thinks is responsible might think, uh, no, another person might think is not responsible, may say is irresponsible. So it's just point being that academic responsibility is a really slippery slope, very hard to define and shouldn't be something that's really invoked as a hard and fast principle. You know, we haven't mentioned Stephen Salida. Uh, that was another academic freedom controversy that led to an AAUP censure. Um, but there the case, uh, the, the, the source of contention was his speech was supposedly uncivil. And the same kinds of questions are, well, what is civil and what is uncivil? And if we start defining what is civil and uncivil, and start restricting supposedly uncivil or incivil speech, then, uh, or what is just defined as incivility, then uh, we may end up restricting a lot of passionate debate that college campuses really should be home to. So short answer to John's question, no, I don't think there ever was a formal apology uh, issued by the U of I in connection with Leo Cook. And I don't know about Salida for that matter. One of the things that you just said, Matt, uh, reminded me of um, the uh, the sections that you had on uh, the Dean of Women at the time in the 60s, who was talking about college campuses being a place of yeast and ferment. Can you talk just briefly about that? Yeah, that was Miriam Sheldon, who um, I found a very interesting person. She was the Dean of Women from 1947 to, I believe, 1967, if you can just imagine the extraordinary change that encompassed. Mm -hmm. um, eventually that uh, position was eliminated, Dean of Women, and then she moved into the Dean of Students office. But in the mid 1960s, she told the U of I Moms Club that, uh, yeah, campuses were places of yeast and ferment, which is kind of a nice metaphor for that, you know, it's like the process of creating good bread. Um, or if you want to kind of um, think in terms of something else that you can brew, um, ideas on campuses are kind of a heady brew. And she said to the moms back in the mid 1960s, and this is the time that the free speech movement was emerging in Berkeley. This was after the JFK assassination when the Vietnam War was escalating, college campuses were becoming uh, increasingly places of controversy and places of student protest. And she was saying, you know, you see a lot of stuff in the media about how this is really scary and really frightening, but you should not be afraid. You should embrace this and you should be proud of your kids being part of this process. This is exactly what university campuses should be. The process of yeast, these um, ideas and this passionate brew of debate and students trying on ideas for a size and sorting out their philosophies and taking and, and uh, forming their social commitments um, and their commitments to causes and so forth. That's just part of the process of a university education. And she said um, from, you know, good yeast produces good bread. And from this university, the University of Illinois will go forth good students. So I call the final chapter of the book Yeast and Ferment because I think it's a really nice metaphor about what a university ideally should be.
Yeah, I thought so too. And I'm, I'm going to find other ways in my, my travels to, to use it. <laughs> I don't know if we have time for a couple of other quick questions. I'm not seeing them. Um, come yeah, the, we've, we've got, got one enough. here uh, from Ian Wang. What is your opinion on the case of UFI Chancellor Wise fired the English professor just before he was to start his job at UIUC? Do, are, are you talking about Salida there or something? Yeah, I'm sure that Salida, who was actually, uh, uh, he was going to teach in the... Um, uh, uh, was it American Indian people, Studies? Yeah, the, the American Indian Studies. Okay. Um, yes, uh, that that's something that I think was unfortunate. If, you know, it, it does have some parallels with um, the cases that we were talking about, and that involved um, extra mural expression. Um, had uh, the hiring gone through, he had already, Stephen Slide had already been offered a tenure professorship. Um, he was kind of denied employment on a technicality, and that the board of trustees had informally approved the, the hiring. Had that hiring gone through as planned, uh, in all likelihood, he, you know, he had posted angry tweets about Israel and the controversy about it would not have re resulted in his dismissal because he would have held a tenured appointment just as Revelo Oliver did. Yeah, the other thing I would say about Oliver, uh, about uh, rather um, Salida was, you know, there was controversy over his tweets about Israel, his angry tweets about Israel and Gaza being anti-Semitic, which he denied. Um, if you compare him to Revelo Oliver, there was absolutely no ambiguity about Revelo Oliver. He was explicitly anti-Semitic in his comments and still kept his job. So, yeah, there are interesting comparisons between Salida and both Oliver and Cook. Are there any other questions? It looks like oh, there's uh, one in the chat from Anastasia. Oh, Kilburn. Uh, oh. Yes, about the, the uh, School of Law and Professor Kilburn. Um, I am not up to date enough on that situation to really comment on it. I do know that Professor Kilburn has been the source of a lot of controversy. And I'll, I'll just make a couple of points really quickly. One is, again, there's a distinction between academic freedom and public opinion. And um, academic freedom really insists on the principle that uh, would, whoever the controversial professor is, or whatever the source of controversy is, uh, the professor should be judged by his or her peers and not by public opinion. And so whatever the public opinion against Kilbourne or other people, Salida or back in the day, Leo Cook or Revelo Oliver, it really should be fellow faculty close to the situation who know all the facts about a situation to decide what should be done or not done. And the other thing I would say is in commenting about any academic freedom controversy, it's, it's really important to try to figure out all the facts. And if you're not close to the situation, and I'm also including myself, because again, these kinds of controversies erupt all the time. And if you're not fully aware of the facts of a situation, it's really dangerous to comment on it, which is why I'm kind of um, hedging my, you know, not taking a firm stand here because I don't know all the facts because uh, I'm not close to that situation. And when you see these controversies erupt you know, on social media and in the news and elsewhere about such and such a professor has said such and such, and isn't it outrageous? It's like, well, we don't necessarily know exactly what is going on unless we're that professor's peers close to the situation and have all the facts. And if we don't have all the facts, you know, maybe just let it rest. <laughs> we have one other question maybe we can squeeze in. Uh, it says, we're members of the Biological Computer Lab directed by Heinz von Forster. And anyhow, involved in discussion of sexual freedoms and other groovy topics of the 60s. Oh, great. Is that a comment? That's a question. Do, do you know? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Let me just check this really. It, it's, in the, it's in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, we're members of that lab. Okay. I thought it said we are members of the lab. Oh. I was like, oh, so you're involved with Groovy Chat. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, I, I think Leo Cook did have his friends on campus. Uh, 
Um, so maybe, but I can't answer that question definitively. I, I didn't see those names come up in my research. One, uh, one last note for me. Uh, one thing, speaking of Cook's friends, um, Harry Tebow, who was very involved in um, uh, civil rights campaigns around town to end discrimination in campus barbershops and movie theaters and restaurants and things like that. He was an outspoken supporter for Cook, which I didn't know until I read your book. And it just made total sense with, you know, everything that I had learned about his, um, his passions and his doings. Yes, he was very much uh, affiliated with uh, left liberal causes on campus, including student civil rights. He was a gadfly in his own right, uh, mm -hmm. just as Leo Cook was. And he said, you know, I will say this very quickly. When Leo Cook was fired, Tebow wrote a letter saying, you know, um, Leo Cook uh, agitates his students, he enrages his students, and this is a good thing because he gets students to think. And that's exactly what professors should do, get students to think uh, by whatever means necessary. I think that's a good note to end on since we're here at, we're past five now. Uh, Heather, do you have anything to, to add to take us out? Yeah, thank you both so much. This has been a really fascinating conversation. And thank you to everyone who has attended our event today. Um, it is has been recorded and we will have it up on YouTube shortly afterwards. You'll receive an email from Zoom that'll have that link for, me, for you. Um, if you would like to purchase your own copy of Dangerous Ideas on Campus, you can use promo code DIOC40 and you'll get a 40% off discount on the University of Illinois Press website. And with that, Thank you all so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.